In the philosophy of mind, substance dualism is the view that there are two kinds of substance, physical or material substance and the non-physical or immaterial substance of souls, minds or consciousness. It contrasts with monist theories and their requirement of only one fundamental substance. Although other theories use the term dualism, they won't be the focus here, so for convenience, substance dualism will be referred to as dualism. Something that instantly triggers our scepticism of this philosophy is the use of the term non-physical substance. What exactly is this supposed to mean? Let's be clear, concepts like truth and justice may be defined as abstract ideas. In that sense, it's reasonable to call them non-physical concepts, but they don't have their own independently active existence. What dualists are proposing is a non-physical thing existing in addition to brains and physical matter as an active thinking entity. Clearly they must explain in what sense a thing that thinks can be non-physical. Some dualists see this non-physical substance as a kind of stuff that lies beyond science, like ectoplasm, a supernatural substance claimed to issue from ghosts and spirit channelers. Richard Swinburne talks of soul stuff that comes in indivisible chunks, but it's somewhat misleading to call this non-physical. It clearly implies something with structure, a kind of physical stuff, albeit an abnormal one. Dualists who claim this abnormal stuff exists need to give evidence of its existence, explain which special property allows this stuff to think when brain stuff can't, and explain how it can be shown that their proposed abnormal stuff possesses that property. Alternatively, if dualists define their non-physical substance as a thing with no physical attributes whatsoever, there are much bigger problems. How is a thing with no conceivable physical aspect meant to think or do anything at all? In what sense could it even be said to exist? If minds are entirely non-physical, what anchors them to particular bodies? These are not questions to be swept aside, nor do they reflect some irrational dread of dualism and its implications. They reflect a reasonable expectation that dualists who make the factual claim that mind or consciousness is a non-physical substance should make their claim comprehensible. Dualists who can't or won't explain coherently what they're proposing have no genuine complaint if dualism gets a poor reception. Likening a non-physical substance to energy, magnetic fields or sound waves channeled by a radio set is obviously a non-starter, as those things are all physical. Saying a non-physical thing is like a physical thing, except it's not physical, glosses over the very thing that needs explaining. Whether what's being proposed is a thinking thing with literally no physical existence or a kind of stuff declared to be beyond science, what's striking about dualism from the outset is its reliance on a concept that defies investigation. These videos examine a range of arguments commonly used to try to justify the dualist's non-physical substance. First, a brief note on terms like soul, mind and consciousness. These are often used interchangeably, but they have crucial differences. Things we classify as operations of mind aren't always conscious. For instance, when we try to recall a piece of information, it may appear quite suddenly in our consciousness, which concerns the contents of our awareness or experience without us ever being aware of the processes of mind that retrieved it. When it comes to souls, the concept of spirit essences that survive physical death needs its own separate evidence long before we throw it into the mix with minds and consciousness. These terms are not interchangeable, so when using them, it should be remembered that statements about one don't automatically apply to another. Why do some claim there are two kinds of substance? Dualists from René Descartes to John Eccles have claimed that some human abilities can't be embodied in physical systems, but we don't know nearly enough to justify such claims. If asked which abilities are needed to play chess, we might once have said an ability to think, but in developing machines that can now beat us at chess, we found that the processes behind playing chess are not endlessly mysterious, but definable in fairly straightforward terms. The very task of building machines that simulate human abilities is forcing us to identify and correct our misconceptions of the processes involved. It requires both an understanding of the principles governing the abilities we want to simulate and knowledge of how to apply that understanding to technology. Descartes said no machine could arrange its speech so as to reply appropriately to whatever is said in its presence. Human ability in language currently surpasses that of machines in many respects, but that may be due to the way we've previously tried to build such abilities into machines, by inputting words and syntactic rules. John McNamara has pointed out that what drives human language acquisition is a child's need to understand and express itself. Human language is more about using words to express ideas. Andrew Locke notes that humans translate language not merely by replacing the words and grammar of language A with those of language B, but by translating the ideas expressed in language A into language B. 
Observations like this are often misinterpreted. They're not intended to show an unbridgeable gap between humans and machines. As Max Fellman points out, the aim is in fact to define the gap more accurately in order to cross it. And artificial intelligence research is exploring the development of machines that learn language through interaction with the world, rather than having words and rules loaded in. Increasingly sophisticated computers and state-of-the-art machines can now do things our ancestors might well have thought impossible. The humanoid robot Asimo can identify faces, speech and gestures, use sign language, navigate its environment, including stairs, detect and avoid objects. It can even hop, jump and run. If we haven't yet simulated specific human abilities in machines, this is not evidence such machines can't be built in principle. It may be evidence of nothing more than the current limits of our understanding and technology. As Steven Pinker notes, the ultimate attainments of artificial intelligence are unknown and will depend on countless practical vicissitudes that will be discovered only as one goes along. The claim that some human abilities can't be embodied in purely physical systems is not only already being eroded by advances in technology, it's also absurdly premature when we have such incomplete knowledge of what physical systems are capable of. Alvin Plantinger says a physical object just isn't the sort of thing that can think, that interaction between physical parts can't produce thought. But he admits his argument depends on intuition, and that maybe not everyone sees things the same way. To those who don't share his intuition, he advises they just think about it some more. And he refers them to a claim by Gottfried Leibniz that if we take a machine that can think and we examine its parts, we find nothing to explain how it does so. According to Plantinger, what Leibniz is saying here is that thinking cannot arise by physical interaction. But we have just been told that the machine itself can think, not that there's some other substance doing the thinking. A machine that can think, even if we can't explain how it does so, can't be used to support Plantinger's claim that machines cannot think. That's just self-contradictory. Intuition and thought experiments about machines that think do not substantiate Plantinger's claim that physical thinking things are impossible. Swinburne tries to support his case for dualism by asking us to imagine the following scenario. You remove his brain and divide it in two, putting each half into an otherwise empty skull. If that's not enough to produce two conscious persons, you add bits to each brain from Swinburne's identical clone. He asserts that once you start them operating, you have two living persons with conscious lives, but you don't know which is Swinburne. He says it may be number one, two, or neither of them, and claims that this shows that you could know everything that has happened to every atom of what was previously his brain, and yet not know what has happened to him. He concludes from this that being Swinburne must involve something else as well as his body. But this argument is fatally flawed, which we can easily show if instead of brains we talk about car batteries. Remove a battery from a car and divide it in two, putting each half into a car with no battery. If each half isn't enough to power a car, add bits to each battery from an identical car. If we now ask which is the original battery, number one, two or neither of them, the trivial and obvious answer is that each new battery has parts of the original. There's no grand mystery forcing us to say that being the car must involve something as well as the physical car. Swinburne's thought experiment tells us nothing more profound than that if we divide the parts of one object to make two new objects, both new objects will have parts of the original. It gives us no special insight into the nature of consciousness. It's a red herring. But it's even worse than that. Let's re-examine Swinburne's wording. He says that if the brain halves aren't enough to produce two conscious persons, we must add more bits of brain from his clone. Unwittingly, Swinburne has told us physical brain matter is sufficient to produce conscious persons. Some dualists claim there are two kinds of substance because of the private nature of our access to consciousness. They argue that while you and I have public access to objects like paintings, you don't have access to my conscious experience, which is private to me. So consciousness must be a non-physical substance. But why should you have access to my experience, if my experience arises from being this vastly complex and unique brain and body, this changing configuration of matter which is separate from you? Dualists have objected that if we examine brains we don't see thoughts. Plantinger complains that examining brains shows us nothing that looks even vaguely relevant to semantic content. But what exactly is Plantinger demanding we should see in the brain? Visible chunks of meaning? Many devices with far more limited functioning than brains encode information in physical formats that don't reveal content. If I film the sea with my digital camera, 
The camera creates a representation of the sea, but there's nothing resembling water among the circuits, and we don't propose non-physical entities to explain that. Certainly, if thoughts had to possess the properties of what they represent, it would be an even bigger problem for dualism. Thoughts of water would have to be both made of water and non-physical. Thoughts may not have weight, colour or texture like physical objects, but they're not a process it's like migration or metamorphosis. So if thoughts and consciousness were representational processes, we wouldn't expect to describe them in the same way we describe objects. It doesn't follow that things we don't describe like physical objects must be non-physical objects. No arguments mentioned so far give us any valid reason to embrace substance dualism. Using terms like physical or mental can mislead us into thinking we must be dealing with a grand division of entities, rather than something more subtle, like a shift of perspective. But let's consider this scene. Someone says they want to move their arm, then their arm moves. From an external viewpoint, brain activity associated with decision-making leads to the chain of neuromuscular activity that results in the movement. The actor, from an internal viewpoint, can report experiencing a decision to move as well as the sensations of movement though how the movement is taking place never enters awareness. The moving arm itself is obviously observable from both viewpoints. This gives us two complementary accounts of the same event. There's what the brain and body are doing and how they're doing it from a third-person perspective, and what the experience of using and being a brain with a body is like from a first-person perspective. The dualist account of this scene typically confuses the two perspectives by attributing an experience with the power to cause movement. Elizabeth Valentine points out that in cases of apparent interaction, we simply choose to focus attention on one aspect of the cause and the other aspect of the effect. If we say psychological stress caused a physical ulcer, this doesn't rule out there being some unmentioned physiological state correlated to the stress. Max Fellmans has also written about this perspectival switching, explaining that when we say a mental event caused a physical event, we're starting with an event viewed from a first-person perspective and switching to how things appear from the third person. As Velmans explains, both perspectives can have value. In medical diagnosis, for example, where both the patient's location of pain and a bodily exam can be helpful. But realising when we're switching stops us misidentifying causation. And this helps us untangle the dualist interaction paradox. The problem of explaining how a mysterious non-physical substance interacts with physical stuff dissolves if all we're dealing with is one substance viewed through different, complementary perspectives. Dualists who argue for the indivisibility of consciousness are contradicted by research on split-brain patients. These are people who've undergone surgery to sever the corpus callosum, which connects the two cerebral hemispheres. This operation relieves severe epilepsy by confining the abnormal electrical activity that causes seizures to one hemisphere, but it does leave the hemispheres functionally separate. Each hemisphere controls the opposite hand and processes information from the opposite side of the visual field. So when split brain patients face a screen fixating on a central point, images flashed to the screen's left side will be registered by the right hemisphere and vice versa. If two different images are shown, one on each side of the screen, and subjects are then asked to describe what they've seen, in most cases they'll describe only the image flashed to the right side of the screen, registered by the left hemisphere, because for most people it's this hemisphere that controls language. But if asked to use the left hand to point at what they've seen, they'll point only at the image from the left side of the screen, registered by the right hemisphere, which controls the left hand. They'll be unable to explain why they pointed at the image, though, because the part of them that can speak isn't aware of what the right hemisphere saw. This divided awareness we see when a brain is divided is consistent with consciousness having some basis in the physical brain, but it directly contradicts the dualist notion of an indivisible non-physical consciousness. Plantinger tries to defend dualism with a thought experiment involving brain halves. He asks us to imagine one of his brain hemispheres, H1, doing all the work his whole brain normally does, while the other hemisphere, H2, is dormant. At midnight, all brain data are transferred from H1, via the corpus callosum, to the dormant H2, which takes over all operations of the body. H1 then gets replaced by a new, identical hemisphere, H3, into which H2's data are transferred. Plantinga says that if H1 and H2 are then destroyed, his brain would be destroyed, but he would continue to exist. But we know why he'd continue to exist. 
He's just told us his brain has been replaced by a hemisphere capable of taking over all brain operations. At no stage in this curious scenario is planting a left with no brain. Only disused brain matter gets destroyed. Like Swinburne's thought experiment in the previous video of his brain being split into two bodies, this scenario is a red herring that requires no non-physical substance. On the contrary, the only indicator of Plantinga's continued existence in this thought experiment is physical data transfer between brain halves capable of taking over all operations. Unwittingly, the one thing to which Plantinga attributes his existence here is a fully functioning physical brain. In another Plantinga thought experiment, all of his body parts are rapidly replaced by other body parts. If the old parts are destroyed, Plantinga declares he would then exist at a time his body doesn't. But again, that's utterly misleading. He's just told us his body has been replaced. The replacement is now his body. All Plantinga is really saying here is that his replacement body exists at a time when his old body has been destroyed. If we rapidly replace the parts of any object destroying the old parts, it's trivially true that the replacement parts will exist at a time when the old parts are destroyed. Say we have a machine, which over time has every atom replaced while remaining fully functional. Then we reassemble the discarded atoms, ending up with two machines. However much we discuss whether the machine is the same machine at different stages of replacement, etc., none of that discussion forces us to propose a non-physical substance to account for the machine's continued functioning during its gradual replacement. That continuity results from the physical maintenance of its functioning parts. Likewise, human cell replacement is a physical process that helps maintain our continuity of being. The functioning and appearance of body parts can remain virtually unaltered for years, despite radical changes at the cellular level. The fine detail of fingerprints can remain identifiable over decades. No non-physical substance is needed to explain these continuities. If normal cells die without being replaced, or they're replaced by defective cells, that's when continuity suffers. This is especially noticeable in brain cells. Degenerative diseases like advanced Alzheimer's can be so devastating to cognitive functioning that sufferers are often described by those who've known them as mere shells. Certain brain traumas lead to unusual aggression or disinhibition. Clearly it's the type of change that matters. Change in and of itself does not inevitably prevent continuity. Dualists who say a non-physical substance maintains certain continuities in a physically changing body are challenged by discontinuities associated with physical brain damage. If the mind is separate from the brain, the specific mental impairments we see after damage to specific brain structures become problematic. The intimate correlation between physical injury and impairment to our conscious experience is especially inconvenient for those who claim that consciousness can survive bodily death. Let's be clear. If the sense organs for sound and vision are destroyed in an otherwise healthy body, no immaterial backup system kicks in, allowing us to see or hear again. If we destroy the senses one by one, we quickly find ourselves unable to perceive anything about our surroundings or even our own bodies. We move into perceptual blankness. If our entire bodies are destroyed, what exactly is it that's supposed to be surviving? How does an agent with no physical manifestation differ from an agent that doesn't exist at all? Swinburne insists that disembodied existence is conceivable, and tries to boost the authority of this statement by claiming that apparent conceivability is evidence of logical possibility. But we can show that this is false. If person X enters a time machine, travels back two years, then finds on leaving the machine it has killed her younger self, this sequence of events is apparently conceivable despite containing logical contradiction. How can she have travelled in the machine if she was killed two years before entering it? Ideas that can seem coherent when not considered in detail may contain impossibilities and be incoherent on closer inspection. I can dream of doing countless things that, given the physics of our universe, may be impossible in waking reality. Apparent conceivability is not evidence of logical possibility. The relationship Swinburne wants to establish simply doesn't exist. And he proves this himself, when he admits that if he consists of nothing but matter, and the matter is destroyed, there's not even a logical possibility that he should continue to exist. This is an admission that it's reality that determines what is possible, not our professed ability to conceive of something being possible. If Swinburne says we can survive without any form of physical embodiment, that's evidence of nothing more than his opinion. Merely proclaiming he can imagine X doesn't remotely support the factual claim that X is a real phenomenon. 
If he wants us to take disembodied existence seriously, the burden lies with him to provide valid reasons for us to do so. Until its flaws and weaknesses are examined and understood, substance dualism can give the superficial impression of addressing some puzzling aspects of mind or consciousness, and many find it appealing because it seems to offer a line of reasoning that allows life after bodily death. However, with the chronic lack noted by Pat Churchland of any positive description of the nature of the mental substance, or of the interaction between the physical and the non-physical, the content of the hypothesis is specified mainly by saying what the second substance is not, making it as inadequate as a theory of light that says only that light is not electromagnetic radiation. With the essentially mysterious, if not incoherent, concept of a non-physical thinking thing at its core, dualist explanations, as Max Velmans points out, don't offer genuine alternatives, because they don't tell us how this thing achieves human functioning. All the problems of explaining how such functions operate in the brain simply regress with added complications. As Velman says, in the 17th century, splitting the universe into two fundamentally different substances, leaving a non-physical consciousness in the province of theology, was liberating for science, enabling investigation of the physical to proceed without interference from the church. But today things are different. Modern science has reclaimed this subject matter and is making progress with evidence-based insights into the phenomena we classify under the terms mind and consciousness. And this will be the subject of another video. ...substance as a kind of stuff that lies beyond science, like ectoplasm, a supernatural substance claimed to issue from ghosts and spirit channelers. Richard Swinburne talks of soul stuff that comes in indivisible chunks, but it's somewhat misleading to call this non-physical. It clearly implies something with structure, a kind of physical stuff, albeit an abnormal one. Dualists who claim this abnormal stuff exists need to give evidence of its existence, explain which special property allows this stuff to think when brain stuff can't, and explain how it can be shown that their proposed abnormal In the philosophy of mind, substance dualism is the view that there are two kinds of substance, physical or material substance and the non-physical or immaterial substance of souls, minds or consciousness. It contrasts with monist theories and their requirement of only one fundamental substance. Although other theories use the term dualism, they won't be the focus here, so for convenience, substance dualism will be referred to as dualism. Something that instantly triggers our scepticism of this philosophy is the use of the term non-physical substance. What exactly is this supposed to mean? Let's be clear, concepts like truth and justice may be defined as abstract ideas. In that sense, it's reasonable to call them non-physical concepts, but they don't have their own independently active existence. What dualists are proposing is a non-physical thing existing in addition to brains and physical matter as an active thinking entity. Clearly they must explain in what sense a thing that thinks can be non-physical. Some dualists see this non-physical subnormal stuff possesses that property. Alternatively, if dualists define their non-physical substance as a thing with no physical attributes whatsoever, there are much bigger problems. How is a thing with no conceivable physical aspect meant to think or do anything at all? In what sense could it even be said to exist? If minds are entirely non-physical, what anchors them to particular bodies? These are not questions to be swept aside, nor do they reflect some irrational dread of dualism and its implications. They reflect a reasonable expectation that dualists who make the factual claim that mind or consciousness is a non-physical substance should make their claim comprehensible. Dualists who can't or won't explain coherently what they're proposing have no genuine complaint if dualism gets a poor reception. Likening a non-physical substance to energy, magnetic fields, or sound waves channeled by a radio set is obviously a non-starter, as those things are all physical. Saying a non-physical thing is like a physical thing, except it's not physical, glosses over the very thing that needs explaining, 